Hi, this is Dr. Don. I want to go over the first quiz in my stat lab with you and hopefully uh, give you some ideas, some information that will help you on the uh, midterm. This first question asks whether or not the data set is a population or a sample. And I think what you need to do when you're looking at problems like this is not read too much into what they're asking. Read the statement and don't add or subtract anything here. The statement is the age of each resident in an apartment building. The answer is that it's a population because it's a collection of ages for all people in the apartment building. Well, let's break that down. We know it's not a sample because the statement doesn't say we're taking a sample or we're, we got 25 of the residents in the building. It says each resident, so that means it cannot be a sample. That gives us two choices. We've got B, population, because it's a subset. Well, that's a key word right there. A population is never a subset. And we're only talking about an apartment building. We don't talk about one of the buildings in the city. So that discounts option B, which gives us C. It's a collection of ages of all people in the apartment building. The second question is again about populations and samples. It says a polling organization contacts 1,357 teenagers who are 13 to 17 years of age and live in the United States and asks whether or not they've attended a concert this past year. What is the population? Well, the first option says teenagers who are 13 to 17 live in the United States have attended a concert. We know that's not correct because that was the question. Have they or have they not attended a concert? Second one is wrong for the same reason. It's got that the question in there, have attended a concert. The last one, teenagers who are 13 to 17, is not specific enough because the question says, and live in the United States. So that means the population is, is Charlie, teenagers who are 13 to 17 and live in the United States. What is the sample? Well, the sample is the 1,357 teenagers who are 13 to 17 and live in the United States. Out of all the teenagers in the country, they sampled 1,357. So that is the, the answer there. It says pretty straightforward. We contacted 1,357. I'm going to reload that one, and we're going to look at a similar question. Polling organization contacts over 2,000 adults who are 20 to 90 years of age, live in Europe, and ask whether or not they voted in the last federal election. So again, that's the question, the last part of the stem. Did they or didn't they, they not vote? And so the population are the adults 20 to 90 who live in Europe. And then we find that one down here. The sample is the 2218 adults contacted who are 20 to 90 and live in Europe. So I hope that helps. The next question ask about whether something is a statistic or parameter. And I like to use the mnemonic device. Population is to parameter as sample is statistic. So let's look. A sample of employees is selected and found that 45% on a computer. It says a sample. Therefore, that has to be a statistic. Let's look at another. Here it says a sample of students selected and found that 45%. If it's a sample and they've got a quantification there, that's got to be a statistic. Let me look at another one. A sample of students and found 55%. Another statistic. In a study of all seniors at a college, it is found that 50% own a television. All implies population. Population says it's got to be a parameter. So I hope that helps. Population parameter sample statistic. This next problem is about samples and how we make inferences about the population, the targeted population, based on what we find in the sample. And here we're given a sample from a targeted population that shows that professional basketball players are taller than people who are not professional basketball players. So from our sample, we could infer that 
professional basketball players are taller than people who are not, since that's what the sample showed. But how can this inference be wrong? Well, just as with any sample, it may not capture everything about the targeted population. Therefore, the inference that the professional basketball players would be taller than people who are not professional basketball players. Let's look at another example. In this one, it says the sample from a targeted population shows that students in first grade are shorter than students in fourth grade. And again, the whole purpose of getting a sample is to make an inference about the population. In this case, we can say that students in first grade are shorter than students in fourth grade in our targeted population. And these other things, students have not taken the vitamins. We don't know anything about that. We don't know that fourth grade students are shorter. Our sample shows just the opposite. And students in first grade may be younger, but we didn't find out their ages. So that's not the inference we can make. And of course, any inference we have can be wrong. In this case, they've reworded the inference a little bit. And you got to read it very carefully. It says the inference may incorrectly imply that if you switched from fourth grade to first grade, you would be shorter than you would be if you were in fourth grade. And of course, that's ridiculous. That inference is, is totally wrong. So just read these very carefully. This next question has to do with the type of data which people seem to get correct pretty well, but they miss the level of measurement. Here we have data in degrees centigrade, of air samples and that looks pretty quantitative to me so quantitative obviously is the first part what is the data set level of measurement well remember in order to be ratio the highest level you've got to have a true zero here degrees centigrade or Celsius just like degrees Fahrenheit there is no true zero so you can't really say that one temperature is double another. The only temperature scale with a true zero is Kelvin, which is not. Therefore, this cannot be ratio. The next level down is interval, and that's what this data is. It's not just ordinal because we can subtract values from one of another to know that something is 20 degrees warmer than something else. So it's more than just the order, and of course it's not nominal. Let's look at another one here. This is inches in length of a species of fish. Therefore, again, it's quantitative because links can have zero length, true zero. Therefore, this would be ratio instead of ordinal. So I hope that helps. The next question is also about levels of measurement, and we're given allergies, temperature, age, and happiness on a scale from 0 to 10. What is the measurement for allergies? So I'm guessing they're going to answer, I have uh, aller allergic to grass, I'm allergic to peanuts, so that would be nominal. What is the level of measurement for age? Age is time, and that can be kind of fuzzy, but there can be a zero age, so age would be ratio. What is the level of measurement for temperature? Temperature, again, unless it's Kelvin, generally when we take human temperatures, it's going to be in Fahrenheit or Celsius. So if there's no true zero, therefore it's interval, which is one scale down from ratio. The last, what is the level of measurement for happiness? Scale of zero to 10. And here, we don't really know if, if the interval from 0 to 1 and 1 to 2 is the same. We don't generally assume it is, but we don't know. So really, it's just order. We are happy. We're more happy. We're very, very happy. Just order. The next question is about sampling techniques, and we're supposed to discuss potential sources of bias. And we assume the population of interest is a student body at a university. We question students as they leave a student union building, and the researcher asks 338 students about their dating habits. So what is wrong with that sample? What kind of sample is it? Well, it is a convenient sample. The researcher is just outside the student union, and as students come out, he asks, will you answer some questions? They may not, may not answer, 
but it's just convenience. It's not cluster. There's no rhyme or reason to what he's doing. He's just taking the easiest one. So it's not cluster. It's not simple random because he's taking students as they come out. They're not randomly chosen. It's not stratified. It's not system, systematic sampling. What potential sources of bias are present? Well, university students may not be representative of all people in their age group, but the population of enters is a student body. Therefore, they are representative of the student body of university. There are no potential sources of bias. Well, that's not true because it's a convenience sample. In a convenience sample, it's only the people you're easy to get. Therefore, they will not necessarily be representative of the target population. And because it's a personal nature in the question, they may not answer or they may not answer honestly. So those are two forms of, of bias. This is a similar question, a little bit different. In 1965, researchers used random digit dialing to call 800 people and asked what obstacles kept them from eating healthier. What type of sampling? Well, it wasn't cluster. It didn't tell us anything about a design here. So it's not systematic. It's not cluster. But it's not convenient because it is a random digit dialing. So at least you're getting a simple random sample. What kind of bias? It says the sample only consisted of members population that easy to get. Well, that's not true. It's a random sample of people that have telephones. So let's look down here further. Telephone sampling only includes people who have telephones. People who own telephones may have been older, wealthier, just different, and therefore not representative. So that's definitely a bias problem. And again, because it's a personal question, they may or may not answer the question or answer the question truthfully, so there's some bias there. And finally, it's only individuals who were there to answer. So again, people may have different work schedules than the period that the person was calling, therefore there's some bias there. Definitely, there are potential sources of bias, so that's not a good answer. So, hope that helps. This question talks about the design of survey questions and how they can be leading, which would lead to bias results. The question is, why is eating cake bad for you? Well, the, just the fact that they say, why is it bad for you, would lead you to think, maybe it's bad for me. So, it's definitely a bias question. Then, how can we make it better? Do you think that eating cake is good for you? Well, that's just the flip side. Putting it good for you would make people think, well, maybe it's good for me. Do you think eating, is, eating cake is bad for you? It's same, essentially, as we have there. Why is eating cake good for you? That's the flip side. Original question is not bias. Well, that's not true. How do you think eating cake affects your health? That doesn't lead you to say it's good or bad. So of all the choices, that's the best question. Let's look at another one here. Why is eating carrots good for you? Well, that's the same question. Let's look one more real quick and see. Why is eating eggs good for you? I think all of these are going to be, yeah, they're all going to be the same type of questions. So I can't really just read the question, see if it leads you to, to lean one way or the other. And if it makes you lean one way or the other, then it's biased. <laughs>